researcher, I'm not a clinician. I work very closely with clinicians. Uh, Tenakoto Kato. The first half of my talk is going to be a little bit like mental health and depression 101 to make sure we're all on the same page. And the second half will be on a study we did looking at whether or not a culturally adapted screening tool for depression was valid to use for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And the third half, no, I'm joking. <laughs> so, we've been doing a bit of audience participation and because you've played so well, I'm going to ask you this question and I'd like you to shout out some options. What is mental health? What life balance? Work life balance? What does that mean? Some of you are a little bit jiffly because you're sick of the hard chairs. 
some of you are looking a little bit uncomfortable because of the hard tears. Some people are looking at their phones. And there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Symptoms are things that you tell me. They're subjective. I can't necessarily see them. So you say, my butt's sore because of these chairs. I'm a bit tired. Or well, frankly, Marie, I'm bored. I'm looking at my eye. So you, I hear symptoms and you describe them using words. I see behaviours. Again, language is important in how signs and symptoms are conveyed. When we look at psychology, psychiatry and mental illness, symptoms are the disorder. That's how they are fun, defined. Now just for psychology 101, I'm going to show you what the difference is between positive and negative symptoms, but I don't come back to it in this talk. Positive symptoms are things in addition to your normal state of being. They're not good things necessarily, but they're some of the things we talked about today, and uh, Mark mentioned some of them. Hallucinations, hearing voices, things in addition to normal. In some cultures, we actually value people who hear voices. They're often faith healers or cultural healers. But when those voices start telling you to jump out the top floor of a 10-story building, they're not helpful and they're no longer part of the cultural spout syndrome. Negative symptoms are things that make you less than yourself. So you slow down, <coughs> you're fatigued, you're tired, you're withdrawn, you don't socialise. Make sense? Some people can not be. So another one question for you. We've talked about the difference between screening and diagnosing things. Why do we need diagnoses? Why do we diagnose anything? Funding. Language is important. 
Now, the DSM-5 indicates that there have been four, and actually five, previous versions, because there's two versions of the three, which means that it's changed over time. So it's not fixed. Diagnoses and mental health and illness are not fixed. The DSM-5 is the first one to really incorporate the cultural aspects, acknowledging that there are cultural things like trance states that are culturally accepted in some groups and not in others. Uh, there are particular disorders that, or, the, or symptoms related to disorders, for example, uh, this, in Japan, you can have an anxiety associated with offending other people, whereas in New Zealand, we're worried about anxiety that hurts ourselves. So they're just a couple of very quick examples. Now let's think about all mental disorders. We'll do a show of hands. Who has more mental disorders, men or women? Who thinks men? Have a look around, make sure you can see everyone. Who thinks women? Who thinks men? Who thinks women? You didn't put up your hand, why not? <laughs> You're not sure? You didn't put up your hand? No. You also don't know? Is there anyone else who has an opinion but didn't put up their hand? No difference. No difference, correct. <laughs> That's not where I'm getting what I'm getting at here. I'm not talking about gender, I am talking about sex. Uh, with the biological sex that you're born with. Uh, so women are twice as likely to be diagnosed with depression. Men are five times more likely to be diagnosed with a personality disorder, which my psychiatrist friend tells me is the most rubbish disorder in the history of psychiatry. For those of you interested, you can go and read more about this, but it's basically a list of things that people do that we don't like. <laughs> So these are five new diagnoses that appeared for the first time in the DSM-5. There'll probably be more in the next one. So you see there's a certain amount of subjectivity to the way we classify and group mental disorders. And I'm not going to go into great detail here, but some of you may know about this, but those of you interested can go and do some more reading. In the DSM-1, 2 and 3, homosexuality, was a disorder. It was removed in the 70s because people voted and decided it was no longer a disorder. That's how objective the criteria are. What was really important here was that a psychiatrist who identified as being homosexual in America could not only lose their ability to practice psychiatry, they could have their medical license revoked. And I can be proud of the fact that the Australian and New Zealand College of Society was the first one to declassify homosexuality. So now I'll get more focused onto the topic which is looking at depression. So how do you get diagnosed with depression? You must have one of these two symptoms. You must either be sad or depressed or have lost interest or pleasure in things you previously found interesting or pleasurable. Without one of those two symptoms, you can't be told you're clinically depressed. Does anyone know what a clinical depression, or why we use the word clinical, what does that mean? Clinical diagnosis? It means it's been brought to the attention of a clinician. So in order to be diagnosed with clinical depression, in addition to one of the two symptoms on your left, you must have a total of five of the symptoms listed here. They must occur most of the time, most days, for at least two weeks. You'll notice that the symptoms on, in category B are changes from normal. Your weight has increased, your weight has decreased. Your diet has changed. Your sleeping has increased, your sleeping is less. You might go to sleep fine, but you wake up at two in the morning and can't get back to sleep. You're agitated, you're too slowed down. The last three are the worrying thoughts that people experience, or cognitions that we associate with depression. <coughs> now I'm going to ask those of you who stand, because I've got the uh, great slot for today, the last speaker. I'm going to ask everyone who can stand to stand, please. <coughs> 
Is this all political correctness? 
There's some really good public health campaigns where we've raised the awareness of things like depression in Australia. There's a group called Beyond Blue where they talk about depression and talking to people about depression. There's Are You OK Day, Ask People Are You OK. These have been great because they have made mental illness a little bit more of a topical conversation that you can have. But where they haven't been good is they've made people think, I understand what depression is. I know what you're going through. And then they stop listening and walk away and the person's no better off. So we have to be careful. People think they understand depression, but do they understand clinical depression, that proper impairment, how it really affects your ability to be here? Now these words, not all of them, but some of them, I've already heard today at this conference, and I sometimes use them. They're crazy, completely psycho, but schizo. But OCD, someone who's super organized, and you say, oh, she's a bit OCD. Actually using that terminology in everyday language and using it incorrectly, is stigmatizing. It trivializes what someone with a diagnosable disorder is going through. There are some of the things that we've talked about at this conference where people have laughed at things and it's a normal <coughs> reaction because it was intended humorously. But we laugh about things related to mental health and illness that we don't laugh about if they were, we were talking about physical illnesses. So if you take nothing away from my talk today other than this, this is a good one to take away. Keep an eye on your language. Make it non-judgmental, especially if you're talking to a family member or a friend who you're worried about. Really try not to judge, it's really unhelpful. The best thing you can do is listen. Ask the occasional question, but listen. Don't tell them to snap out of it. Don't tell them to run outside and get some exercise. Don't tell them to toughen up. Listen and offer help. Ask if they want someone to take them to the doctor or take them out or visit them. We use something called person first, so we say a person with depression, a person with schizophrenia. We don't call them a schizophrenic or a depressed person, a depressive. We talk about lived experience or living with mental illness. And the reason this is important is because stigma stops people getting help. So you can do your bit. When is a disorder not a disorder? Another thing that's happened with the increase of the general awareness of things like depression and common terms, we've sort of expanded into this catch-all phrase of mood disorders. I don't know what mood disorders are. And we're losing that diagnosis, that categorization. So if someone tells me someone has a mood disorder, I don't know how you treat a mood disorder, but anxiety, depression, schizophrenia. So there's some downsides to normalizing and increasing the understanding of some of these phrases. And as I've already talked about with the DSM and its five different versions, or six, our thresholds between when is a disorder a disorder and when is it normal is completely arbitrary. And so what is more important? The number of symptoms, the severity of the symptoms, the frequency of the symptoms, the quality of the symptoms, all of the symptoms together. And another phrase everyone likes to use now is they're on the spectrum. We're all on a spectrum. But being on the spectrum doesn't, warrant, doesn't mean you need treatment or you need a service. So again, watch your language, be careful. Why am I talking about depression and why am I interested in it? is because it begins in early life. In your early 20s, it's the most common age. Once you've had it, you're at the greatest risk of having it again, but not everyone has it. It's the rule of thirds. A third will have it once, a third will have it repeatedly over their lifetime, and a third will always have persistent depression symptoms of those who have a first episode. It's associated with great impairment in your ability to be you. It increases your use of healthcare services. It's harder to stay employed. It's harder to maintain a good income. Depression can lead to suicide, but it's not the only reason people suicide. And in fact, suicide for many people is impulsive, so you can have depression without being at risk of, having, of suiciding, and vice versa. 
Depression, especially if caught early, is treatable. And as I move on to the second half of my talk, this is why we started what I'm going to talk about next. There are almost no data on depression in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. The data we do have has used Western screening tools or diagnostic tools. So now I'm going to talk to you about the Getting It Right study, which started with this study, the Men's Hearts and Minds study. It was conducted by Professor Alex Brown when he was a medical uh, graduate and completing his PhD. And he was really interested in the way the mind and the cardiovascular system worked in Aboriginal people. And this picture, which is very difficult to see on this screen, is one of the people who took part in that study who said, I can paint you that relationship. And they have, and they've talked about even sticky blood cells and how depression and heart disease might be related. So the Men's Hearts and Minds study was conducted with 189 Aboriginal men, and yes it was just men in the first study, who lived in urban and remote central Australia. It was conducted in five Aboriginal language groups within the community, and each of those language groups had their own governance system, ways of knowing and doing and being. And they did a qualitative study with them first. So they went out with a culturally trained bilingual interpreter <coughs> to each of those five groups separately and said, tell us what depression looks like in your community. So they all shared their information, they collected that information and they took it away. Words like depression were well understood and didn't need further translation. But they took what they got from these interviews away and went, can we find an existing screening tool that looks like the depression that has been described by these five groups? They identified five freely available, by that I mean you don't have to pay, screening tools for depression. They took them back to each of those five communities independently and said, do any of these look like anything you've described? And they all had to agree independently. They all selected a screening tool called the PHQ, which stands for Patient Health Questionnaire 9, which stands for nine questions. So over the next 12 months, Alex and his team translated and adapted the PHQ 9 to make it culturally appropriate. So this is the original PHQ-9. You can see in the top left hand corner the time frame for symptoms is over the last two weeks, the same time frame I'm using with you. And the nine questions down the left hand side represent those category A and category B symptoms that you've all seen now. The four columns, which are not at all several days, three or more days, and nearly every day, show you indicate how frequently you experience the symptoms. As they were adapting the tool, as I mentioned, there was no further adaption needed for the word depression as it was understood. But the term hopeless took the entire 12 months because in Aboriginal languages, they don't have a word for time. And in order to talk about hopelessness, you need to be able to talk about the future. So this is the adapted tool, and you'll look across the number two, which has moved now to have you been feeling unhappy, depressed, really no good, that your spirit was sad. That was what they all ended up agreeing on, providing several options to convey the same information. There is not a huge difference in the wording here, but they are important differences to the communities involved. Questions five and eight, which had opposing systems within them, they suggested they be split out into those two opposing questions and asked directly. Now the whole point of this adaptive wording is so that this tool can be translated into language and back into English without loss of meaning. So they did test that in a small study within the community where this was developed in men and women and it did seem to be true, it did seem to work as it was supposed to. Over the 12 months, 
and also identified these other seven questions that they said were also important, they thought, in their community to help diagnose depression. They thought men with depression exhibited many of these symptoms. Things like, do you think you have too much worry, or have you felt cranky, irritable, or always in a bad mood? They aren't actually in those original nine questions that you've all seen. So we were funded, thankfully, by the Australian Government to conduct the Getting It Right study. We commissioned an Aboriginal artist up in Newcastle in New South Wales to do an artistic representation of what the study was about. We spent some time talking to her and explaining how this tool was developed. That what we wanted to do is see if it did what it said on the tin. Could this adaptive tool that seemed to work within the community where they adapted it be shown to work outside of that community? And I'm sure by now you've read what all of the things in this picture represent. And this is really important when you work with Aboriginal communities to have art and lots of time taking consultations with community and then you will find that working in those communities is easy. So the Getting It Right study was conducted in 10 primary healthcare services or GP services. We needed 500 participants they needed to self-identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. They needed to be adults. And attending a primary healthcare service or service event. And be able to give uh, informed consent. We excluded people with known psychosis and bipolar disorder because the symptoms overlap so much with depression and it would have made, could have made the results very difficult to interpret. How a validation study like this works is one person administers the APHQ-9, so this newly validated tool. In our study, that could be provided in paper, or it could be provided on a computer, and people could complete it themselves, and it was in English. Or it could be interview administered, it could be read out by an English-speaking person, or, if required, a person who spoke the local language. We also got usual demographic information. Then, the same person who had completed the APHQ-9 was then assessed using what we call the gold standard, so the best method we've got despite not having an objective diagnosis for depression. Uh, the gold standard was the mini tool, so this is probably the most widely used for fully structured psychiatric interview, and it's designed and shown to work if you and lay people administer it as well as trained lay people that is, as well as psychiatrists and psychologists. Now the psychiatrist, psychologist, GP who was trained to administer the MINI was a different person from the person who administered the APHQ-9 and they didn't know the results of each other's uh, interviews. The APHQ-9 was always administered first and there had to be no more than seven days between those two assessments because when you go further than that, you might be finding a new episode of depression, because depression is by nature a chronic relapsing disorder. We had on average zero days between the two interviews. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this map of Australia, but the different colours represent most, but not all, of the different Aboriginal language groups across the country. There's well over 250. And these are the locations of the 10 primary healthcare services where we conducted the study. So you'll notice we didn't have Tasmania, we didn't have the Torres Strait, and we didn't have the Kimberleys. But we had pretty good coverage all up. What did we find? We found that the APHQ-9 worked as a screening tool for depression across all of these communities. We looked at those extra seven questions to see whether one or more of them in combination or on their own helped with the diagnosis of or was looking for risk <coughs> for depression, and they didn't. Three questions slightly improved what we call sensitivity and specificity, but not enough to warrant asking a further three questions. And we asked people themselves what they thought of the PHQ-9, because that's really important. Great as a tool works, but everyone hates answering the questions. 
So I'll just also give you the results from the mini, which was the formal diagnosis that people could or couldn't receive. So we also asked about post-traumatic stress disorder, because that can be thought to be quite high in Aboriginal communities, especially with their experience of intergenerational trauma and marginalisation <laughs> and the long-term term effects of colonisation. And we also looked at generalised anxiety disorder. The green circle with MDE in it is major depressive episode. The pinker one is generalised anxiety disorder and the blue is post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the things you can see, hopefully very obviously, is that there's massive overlap. And that's really common. So most people with depression will also have a diagnosis or problems with anxiety. So all up, 70% of people had no disorder at all, no diagnosable disorder, so that's a good thing. But 30% is high. We are standard community attending GP services. They didn't go to have their mood assessed or to look at depression, they just went because they had an annual health check to do. Sixty-nine percent of the population had one or more other chronic diseases. So where depression is associated with increasing age is where as people age, they tend to have more chronic diseases, and that includes things like high blood pressure, not just heart attack, stroke, or kidney disease. Fifteen percent of our population had four or more chronic diseases. So I said we asked people explicitly what they thought of the new questions and their wording. And people mostly liked them. So they thought that the number of questions was fine, they were easy to understand, they felt comfortable asking the quest answering the questions, they had time to answer the questions, the questions weren't too personal. This is the only one where we had, I can't remember the actual number, we had a reasonable number of people saying some of the questions were a bit too personal. But out of all of the 500 people in the study, <coughs> All 500 completed the APHQ9, and only three people missed one question on the PHQ9, and they all missed a different question. So we don't think this was a big problem. And we published the results this year, so if anyone wants to look into this sort of literature, it's available in the Medical Journal of Australia. Um, we thought we'd design the questionnaire nicely. So this is the freely available tool that a GP might get someone to complete if they came to assess them for depression. This one's without scoring, and this one is with scoring, and you'll see the scoring instructions at the bottom of the tool. So this tool, which is a culturally adapted tool for and by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, is a screening tool. It's not diagnosis. It's not a diagnostic tool. So it tells a GP very well who is well, very accurate at saying this person is healthy, and it indicates those who need to go on and have a proper structured assessment to see if they're unwell. It can be completed on paper, on a computer, by an interviewer in language or in English. So I just thought I'll end here with what does dep depression treatment look like in the general population, just for completeness. Uh, we use something called stepped care. And that, if you think of a set of steps, means you start with the simplest or you start with nothing. And as the steps increase, uh, the treatments get more intense and more specific. Some of you might think it's odd to have do nothing as the first step. It's actually what we call guideline based. Because depression is a chronic relapsing disorder, if you do nothing, some people get better anyway. The placebo response in antidepressant trials is 40%, and it's probably related to depression getting better on its own. But for people who present for the first time with mild or moderate symptoms, you'd want to assess them again in a couple of weeks to see whether the symptoms are pers persisting before you moved on to a higher level treatment. And some of our most effective mental health interventions are safe housing, secure food supply, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, 
And as the steps increase, they go from self-help and freely available tools to counselling and talking therapies, through to medication, most people are thinking of antidepressants at this point, then combination treatments, talk to talking therapy and medication, right up to ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy. And I'd just like to thank you all for paying attention and getting this far in the afternoon. And I'll leave this slide up for questions. So these are where people can go and find resources for yourself or for others in terms of help in Christchurch and New Zealand generally. Cross-cultural adaptive models for treatment 
but thanks for the question. I've got these here just in case someone asks. So this is from one of the healthcare workers. This is another one. So there's not just a cultural concern. So the short answer is probably no culturally adapted other than taking people on country and doing something very different to what clinical psychology looks like. Um, a real concern about talking about mental illness, asking people about, are you thinking of harming yourself, killing yourself? Genuine worry that that would make people go away and harm themselves and kill themselves. Because for you, there is zero evidence that that happens. That it's not a problem. You can ask people. But what happened is that people took part in the study because they knew them. And the staff were genuinely surprised. So these are direct quotes from staff. We had this person here. Um, so remember this is a research study, so we're not supposed to be changing clinical practice because it's a study. At this point we don't know whether the measure does anything. The, for the second interview, they went out to this guy's house to do the second interview, the mini. And they phoned us up afterwards and they said, we've just spent three and a half hours with this guy. And he told, he brought out his photo albums, he told us all about his family. He said, this is amazing what you're doing, I really like the way you're thinking. And so we thought, oh, that's really nice, we're really happy about that. Three days later, that man died. His family came into the house service and thanked them for going out and talking to him. He had phoned them up and said, they came out and I told them our story and I showed them what I, and he felt, he felt that he was part of the community. So having that ability to talk about your culture, the ability to have someone to just sit and listen, especially with older people, that often doesn't happen. Everyone's so busy. So there's really, simple things that we can do culturally that might not be even strict talking therapies but often there's things that people understand if they're culturally competent so they can deliver something called cognitive behaviors therapy in a culturally competent way they know the local terms the idioms the communities whether or not someone's then gone to look at whether a culturally competent person is better than a